Hello, St. Stephen's. My name is Marcus Edwards, and I'm here today to give a testimony of my life and time of uh, kidney failure and the uh, life-saving transplant that I received. Uh, everything started with a, uh, a test uh, in uh, June of 2018, where I started having potassium issues. Uh, took care of that and I was cleared to travel and I was headed to Florida for work for a uh, training assignment and while I was there I became ill and didn't know what it was I kind of thought it was maybe a, a virus or the flu so I missed most of my training and I had to stay in my room and uh, I began to hydrate and just try to fight off this uh, virus the best that I, I could and uh, at the end of the uh, training session when it was time to fly home I landed at uh, Stanford uh, uh, International Airport Mahamawali International Airport and uh, my brother-in-law was there to pick me up and I asked him to take me straight to the emergency room once we got to the emergency room uh, they did their uh, examinations and uh, the doctor came in and he said that I was in acute kidney failure. So at that moment, I had to have emergency dialysis and I had to have a, a, a port put in, a temporary port put in, so I could do dialysis and try to regain my kidney functions. And uh, I did that for about three weeks and they ran the test and found that my kidneys had come back. And that lasted for three weeks and I was in the same situation again and back in the hospital and emergency dialysis again. And this time I was going to be there for a while. And so at that time, that's when things really, really started to, uh, to get dark and, uh, I started feeling uh, the nervousness and the and the uh, just the, the thoughts and and answerless uh, questions. I was alone, all alone in the hospital uh, due to COVID. Family couldn't stay, and it got late, and I couldn't sleep. And I just began to ask God, you know, why. Why me? Why was this something that I had to endure? And it was just questions that almost anybody would ask. And, you know, and at that moment, there wasn't an answer. So uh, after I went through all of the, you know, the questions and things, I just asked God to, to take this and to give me the strength to do what I had to do and, and, and the strength for my family to help them bear through this. And uh, at that point, you know, I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and the direction and, and the strength and the will were, were totally different. Uh, he gave me the strength to Ask the questions that I needed to, the strength to to go on and, and take the medications and the dialysis that I needed to to survive. So this was uh, about the whole time took about three years, and in the first year uh, after being on dialysis. And all plans changed. You know, uh, we couldn't travel. We couldn't do the family things like camping. Uh, I couldn't swim. You know, I just, there was very little I could do. Uh, when I was in center, it was a five and a half hour ordeal, three days a week. And then the other four days a week, you know, they're in between. It was just days of rest for my body to catch up. 
from the dialysis. And so then I would have to start it all over again. And uh, the quality of life was that I was alive, but the quality of life wasn't there. So uh, my wife and I, we, uh, we inquired about bone dialysis. And so they uh, set it up and they, they trained us and we were going through a, uh, went through a six week training period you know, for home dialysis. And uh, this is right dead in the heat of COVID. And so near the end of the training, once uh, it was time to go home, the nurse came to the house and uh, she then taught my wife how to insert the needles. So basically my wife became my in-home dialysis nurse. And uh, Chantel took up a, a big role and was a big part of, uh, of my survival. And, uh, you know, I could never thank her enough and for her strength and her courage. You know, I think that's what, uh, what I asked God for and that's, that's what he gave me. So uh, later in that year, after being on this machine, you know, four days, five days a week. We were on dialysis one night and she had came in the room and asked me, she said, uh, I want to ask you something. And I was thinking, man, you know, there's <laughs> can't be any more worse than what I'm going through, you know, so, you know, what is it? <laughs> and uh, she was like, well, you know, we've had to cancel everything and you've, uh, you know, you've been strong and, you know, taking care of yourself at home. So she wanted to take me to a Bears home game. It was my first home game for the, uh, the Bears. I've seen them play in other stadiums and other cities, but never at home. So we made a weekend out of it and uh, we went to the game. So before the game, you can walk around the stadium, you know, they have a bunch of different sites. You know, it, was, it was neat, it was, it was a great time. And right before we went to our seats, we came uh, to a, uh, a booth and uh, it was uh, uh, Staley Bear, the Bears mascot. And the booth was create your fanatic fan sign. And so uh, I grabbed a piece of cardboard and uh, I grabbed the markers and uh, I just started writing. You know, it was nothing planned. It was a spirit of moment, and so uh, I just let God direct me, and I wrote uh, in green, I need a kidney. I wrote in red, my blood type, O, and on the bottom, I wrote my phone number. <laughs> Chantel looked at me, and she said, are you really going to do this? I said, yeah, hey, you know, it's a no if you don't ask. So we took the sign and uh, went to our seats and when the game began, so, you know, when uh, they were playing, we were watching the game and I decided that every time out of the commercial break, then I would hold my sign up. And I did that throughout the game. And in the fourth quarter, the lady sat next to me. I mean, just a beautiful soul and her and her husband and uh, she said, would you mind if I took a picture of you and your son? And I said, sure. And uh, she took the picture and then she whispered to me, she says, we're gonna make this go viral. And I thought, yeah, you know, everybody says that, you know, and what's the chance of, you know, this really going viral? <laughs> you well, know, little did I know, uh, this went viral. And before we got to our seats, I found it rained so much that it died. I was getting calls from, you know, all over Chicago right now. And uh, I thought it was great. And I would, you know, answer them when I could. And my phone died. And we got to the hotel and I plugged my phone up and it started ringing again and messages started coming through. So, you know, I was answering the people and just trying to, you know, just be cordial because I didn't really know what to say at the time, you know, but take your name and number and I would send them a message. 
And uh, by the time we got back to Louisville, I was getting calls from across the country. And it was just people, you know, wanting to help. Just complete strangers. Uh, not all the phone calls were people wanting to donate. Uh, some of the phone calls were just people wanting to, you know, uh, give a word of encouragement or ask could they pray for me. And that led to a lot of strangers praying for me or I would see somebody that saw the sign or saw the post and they'd say, you mind if we pray for you for a second? And uh, that was that was big for me. It's, uh, that helped me to draw closer to God and to continue to leave this in his hands because this, you know, had to be his work. And so I just continue to keep the faith. And uh, almost two years went by and the news that reported my story, uh, a lot of news outlets did, but there was one that really stuck with me. And it was uh, Lauren Adams from WLKY. And uh, she came to the house and did an interview and uh, spoke to my, my my boys. And she ran the interview and we talked and we got to know each other and we talked about our families, you know, and this journey. And before she left, she said, uh, We're gonna run this around Thanksgiving. I said, okay, that's great. And uh, Thanksgiving ran and she called and she asked, did I see it? I said, yeah, it was great. And she said, if I, next Thanksgiving, you haven't found a kidney, we're gonna rerun this again. And we're gonna start it all over. And uh, during that time, pandemic still in full swing. Uh, she was in, the, in the midst of uh, having another child. And uh, she called me up and she said, well, I can't come see you because I can't, you know, I'm pregnant and I can't be around anyone. She said, but I'll send my cameraman and we'll do it virtually. And she asked me the questions. We talked, to, told the story and she ran it again. And when she ran it, the lady saw it and she inquired about it and you know she talked to her family and and uh, she told her mom she said I think I'm gonna I'm gonna get tested I probably won't match but I'm gonna get tested and she tested and uh, the preliminary tests were matched <laughs> so she told her mom you know I need you to ride to Cincinnati with me so she rolled the sense in the head and she did the second stage of testing. And uh, that's the tissue type and, and we were a perfect match. So uh, she decided she was going to go ahead and she was going to do it. And I still didn't know anything about her. I didn't know her. I didn't know that there was a donor out there. I was still waiting. And I had worked most of the time with this. So I had worked almost two years you know, uh, with doing the dialysis or doing dialysis and trying to have some normalcy in life. So, you know, I was fighting, you know, from day one I was fighting and that was that was my thing. I was gonna fight until the end, you know, it was gonna have to take the end to, to come full circle for me to quit fighting. And uh, I started, you know, deteriorating and things started getting rough, you know. I never once again asked God, you know, why me? I never once again, you know, asked him to take it away. I just asked him to continue to give me strength to bear with this. And he did. And uh, my wife and my children, they stepped up and uh, helped out as much as they could and, and were positive, you know. And I just asked them, I was like, yeah, the biggest thing you can do for dad is to stay in school, get your grades, you know, and, and just be strong, you know. So when we come out of this, you know, you guys are gonna still be ahead and everything's gonna be great. And I, you know, I was always, you know, 
pessimistic that we would come out of this. I, I, I just knew that we were going to come out of this. But it was it was getting it was getting late in the hour, and uh, the only person that, that I think knew was my wife that uh, that I was I was starting to kind of doubt that uh, I would ever find the match. And uh, two of the transplant centers that I was with had me do some more testing. And uh, it didn't look like I was gonna, you know, I was gonna make it to the operating table. One said that there was something going on that they didn't think I was healthy enough for the operation. And then the other one was like, hey, you know, we don't see it. We think you're great. You know, you're ready for it. You're a great candidate. Just, you know, keep healthy and, and we're gonna get you to the finish line. And uh, September came around. And uh, my wife said, look, we're not gonna keep sitting around here waiting so we can do things, so we can, you know, she said, we're gonna go to another game. We're gonna go to this preseason game, you know, while it's still warm and we can enjoy the city while we're there. And I was like, well, that's great, let's do it. So, you know, I had uh, all my dialysis treatments back to back so I can have a weekend off. And, uh, it was a Friday and I took the car into the shop to get the oil change, the tires rotated so we can go on the road and, uh, and make it there safely. While I was in the waiting room, my phone rang and it was at the University of Cincinnati. And I felt it, but I wasn't sure. And I picked up the phone and it was my transplant coordinator. And she said, Marcus, we have a date. And she said, your transplant surgery will be October 18th. And uh, that was the biggest moment of my life. And uh, I didn't ask any questions, you know. I went through the procedures and I, I talked to all the surgeons and uh, anesthesiologists and everybody that was going to be involved with my part of surgery. And I still, you know, asked, uh, will I get to meet the donor? And they, uh, they said, we don't know. We can't tell you that. The donor side is, is a whole different side. I've got the recipient side and then there's a donor side and the two don't come together until it's time for the surgery. So, you know, I bought some pins, you know, like a lapel pin, and they were the 100th season of the Bears in the NFL. And they had the Green Bay Packers and the Chicago Bears on the pin. So I said, if I don't get to meet the donor, then I'm going to send the pin to the donor. Because that's how they saw the sign with me at the Bears game. <laughs> and then the surgeon, Dr. Shaw, who we had had a couple of phone calls and they weren't all about the surgery. You know, we talked about football, about the kids and where he went to school and where he's lived. And it was just a personable phone call. So the day of the operation, I felt like I knew who was going to be working on me. And I had that much more faith in him. So I made sure he got a pen. And man, we had that operation and it seemed like it took forever for me to get to the, the table and get ready. But it seemed like a blink of an eye. I was recovering. And so uh, they brought the, uh, they were my, the, the, the recovery nurse, it was, it was a gentleman, his name was Jim. And he was just like, Mr. Edwards, I'm gonna do everything I can to make you comfortable. I'm gonna do everything I can to, to help you in this recovery process and get you up to to your, uh, your regular room. And I mean, he was on it. He was great, you know? And uh, I always like to talk to people about their kids because I like to talk to me about my kids. And he was a single dad. He had a daughter, you know? And he was just as proud of his, his kids as I was mine. And mind you, I didn't feel any pain. I, 
I was just, I was happy. I had, had uh, good attention. And uh, Jim asked me, he said, do you want to meet the donor? I said, yes, I do, if she wants to meet. And there was some kind of confusion where everybody didn't think we wanted to meet. He had to change, we had to change shifts and the next nurse came in. She was just as great. And she said, uh, asked me that I want to meet. And she said, I said, yes. She said, well, Jim said so. And so I'm going to meet with the uh, donor nurse and we're going to see if we can make it happen. <laughs> and, uh, so the donor was on our way home day two and, uh, the nurse and my nurse, they got together and she was able to stop in and we were able to meet. So she became my angel and my friend and, and family. And it was just, it was an incredible feeling meeting her, the lady that saved my life. And, uh, I just can't, I can't thank her and all the support I had through this time and family far and near and friends that prayed and supported and those that were tested and didn't match and continue to support and continue to spread my word and, and continue to get me to the finish line. Because at times, like I said, just my wife knew that I didn't think I was going to make it. I wouldn't let anyone else know that because I, I had, I had two daughters, and they were uh, 21 and uh, 18, and they have a lot to go for. And I just, I wanted to make sure that that they were, they were good with everything. And you know, I was worried about maybe never seeing them walk down the aisle. My two boys who were hadn't graduated yet, you know, and they were going to school and they're athletes and I'm not gonna see them graduate. I'm not gonna see their their ball games. And then for this this perfect stranger to trust in God and she said that God stayed on her heart and that's why she continued with it and went through it. And for him to deliver her to me and deliver me from this chronic illness. It was just, it wasn't a miracle. It was God's work. And I thank her and I thank everybody that stepped up. Uh, I thank the church for uh, the cards of, of, of encouragement and affirmation that they sent and the phone calls and uh, the happy hour Bible study, you know, they uh, they called and checked on me and, and prayed for me. And we were doing this virtual and then they would, they would you know, pray for me. And uh, Miss Ann Wills called on a regular basis to check and, and see how I was doing and, and made sure that, you know, my wife needed everything and make sure that my kids that they didn't need for anything. And that was that was the support that they got me through and and that's what enabled me to allow God to do his work was knowing that he had put these people there to keep me strong and to keep me moving forward. And uh, I just, I just want to tell anybody, because we all go through different things. It's not all, you know, kidney failure. But we go through some things where we've got to, we've got to fight. You've got to take the tools that God has given you, and you've got to fight. You know, put it in His hands. But He doesn't say just. Give it to me and, and give up. You got to give it to him and you've got to fight. You've got to take the, the strength and the courage and the wisdom that he, he still stows in you and you've got to fight. You got to fight for you and, and your family. 
and your friends that they count on you. You've got to fight. And uh, with me as an, as an African American, I learned a lot in this journey. I learned that uh, on the uh, organ donor recipient list for kidneys, the list is 120,000 people and growing. And of this list, the majority makeup is African American. And so we've got to be strong for one another and we've got to educate ourselves on yet another disease that affects our genetic makeup. And we've got to, to help, you know, God gave us two kidneys because he knew what he was doing. He knew that there would be someone who needed one and that we could help that person as a living donor. You know, it doesn't have to be a deceased donor, it could be a living donor. And they can share their spare and donate to you and give you life and give you a second chance. So I urge anyone that feels the, the need that they can help or you know wants to help uh, to uh, contact your local transplant centers, uh, Jewish Hospital, University of Cincinnati, uh, Purdue. There's there's a bunch of great kidney transplant centers. I had the greatest experience at the University of Cincinnati. But you can contact the Kidney Organ Donors, Kentucky Organ Donors Association, CODA. And if you want to help save a life, and it could be a complete stranger, it can be a family member, a neighbor, and if you're healthy enough to donate a kidney, please, please help reduce this list and give some of these people this second chance at life. So I'm currently working with a, uh, a living donor search group, a kidney living donor search group. It's a nonprofit uh, organization and they help to uh, educate and pair uh, organ recipients or kidney recipients for living donors. Uh, I'm working uh, to bring the African-American awareness side through this group. Uh, they're great people. They're the Mulligans Living Donor Group. They're on the Facebook. It's uh, ran by beautiful lady, Leanne Sayers, her and her husband, Mike. Uh, they have Sunday meetings. Uh, they help to connect you with uh, different uh, transplant centers. Uh, she's gone uh, nationwide now, so she'll be uh, traveling in different uh, cities and states, and I'll be working with her to help, uh, you know, bring the uh, African American side or anybody. But I just want to help, you know, our people because I am, you know, a uh, face, you know, that they can uh, recognize with. So. Uh, if you guys have any questions and you want to uh, see what uh, the group's about, you can find it on Facebook under Mulligan's Living Donors Group. Like uh, the golf saying Mulligan uh, Redo, and that's basically how she got it, you know, because this is a, a redo. Uh, I encourage you guys to uh, look the site up and uh, gain some more information or if you know anyone who's in this uh, situation and going through uh, kidney failure and needs help, uh, I encourage you to have them uh, seek out the Mulligan Living Donors Group. And if they need to, they can contact me uh, on Facebook. I can also get them in touch with the group and there's meetings uh, for second Sunday of every month didn't come out and uh, make contacts. Uh, she's really, really connected with the University of Cincinnati and the, the leading surgeon of the kidney uh, uh, transplant uh, center. So once again, that name is uh, Mulligan's Living Donor on Facebook.